This podcast is brought to you by Infinite Resources, a local staffing agency connecting diverse job candidates and central Iowa companies. Amplified. All right, so Melissa Clark Wharf, thank you for joining me. You are the co-founder of Can Play, an amazing organization that we're going to get into. Um, but as I was telling you off the air, I started doing my, my podcast uh, in 2019. And my golden rule was always like, I need to be excited to who my guest is going to be. Like, And uh, when we connected and after we spoke and you told me about your organization and the work that you do... Um, I was like, we have to talk. We have to discuss this. So thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you making time. Um, can you introduce yourself and, and can play and what you do and, and uh, your organization? You bet. Thank you also. It's great to be here today and my first podcast. So yes, uh, uh, not bad for an old lady here trying to get into the current <laughs> times. But uh, as you said, uh, I'm a co-founder of Can Play. And really uh, what Can Play is a local nonprofit serving the greater Des Moines community. Uh, serving kids living with barriers to play, whether it's financial, physical, cognitive, emotional, or chronic health conditions, we remove, we, we remove the barriers to play mm -hmm. uh, for them to be active um, and also have a social outlet in yeah. their communities. Um, and then our organization uh, is actually 13 years old. So uh, it, previous was two organizations called Courage League Sports and uh, Opportunity on Deck. And then our other co-founder, Dylan DeClerc, and I uh, got together during COVID and felt we could be better together. And we formed Cam Play during that time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with under our Cam Play umbrella are opportunity programs, which serve kids with financial barriers to play. And then our adapted programs, which serve kids living with special health care needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what stuck with me or a lot of things that stuck with me when we talked is that you said that you look at children's um, abilities not their disabilities. Can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? You bet. Um, so I have a son that has uh, different challenges, has some cognitive delays and lost the right side, use of the right side of his body from some strokes. So, you know, everybody kept telling me and him everything he couldn't do. Uh -huh. And it really uh, it continued to settle with me like, oh, well, he can do things. We just have to figure those out. Uh -huh. And in starting this organization and our programs, you know, we just we saw kids and you look at them and they do have abilities and we really work on bringing that, those abilities out, you know, whether they use their right hand or their left hand, or they use a, a, a walker to get around like, okay, use the walker as another leg to hit the ball or something like that. So we really focus on what they can do and, and, you know, we don't not acknowledge their challenges, but we want them to be seen and know that they can be successful and they can play. Yeah. And you also said that there's a lot of um, like you have a big waiting list. So so the resources are, are uh, limited to to this community. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot that is out there, but can you speak on how much more work that needs to be done? You bet. So just in greater Des Moines alone, there's over 68,000 children living with a special health care need, whether mm -hmm. it's, again, that physical, cognitive, or emotional, or living with autism. So the numbers are staggering and are just uh -huh. in our community. And I was just uh, amazed when I looked that up when I was starting this. Mm -hmm. On the other side, of with our opportunity programs, one in four kids, one in five kids are living with financial barriers in mm -hmm. low-income homes. So uh, really, it's about um, just removing those barriers and, um, you know, with so many kids affected, uh, and limited resources, I think people want to do things and, and be more, uh, inclusive, mm -hmm. but I think they're scared or nervous that there might hurt them or, or, you know, just aren't sure how to do it. Uh -huh. Um, because this, this, you focus on, uh, adapted sports, right. But there's also, um, uh, like lack of jobs, um, uh, health uh, resources. Mm -hmm. um, is is there like so for mom, mothers, or fathers, or families that have 
uh, children with uh, disabilities. Um, is there a, a place or like a epicenter place where they can go and like find resources or? There's really not an epicenter available to them. Uh, there's some great organizations here locally, uh, Ask Resource Center. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, Iowa Workforce Development available. Uh, there's the Center for uh, Disability and Development through Iowa City. So there are resources out there, but they're mm -hmm. limited. And uh, I think you're so overwhelmed as a parent um, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's the best course for your child. Uh, I know what I went through um, as Jack was uh, getting through college and or not college through high school uh, and looking embarking on adulthood. And mm -hmm. we went about 19 months of trying to figure out his new normal and mm -hmm. his uh, his schedule and things like that. So in trying to find him employment, you know, uh, he. Uh, he has filled out job applications where he checked the box that he had a disability and he's filled out the exact same job application and didn't check the box. When he didn't check the box, he got an interview. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when he walked in a few times, I followed him in and some employers were like, oh, sorry, we don't have a job. Because uh, they, they looked at him and saw how he walked sure. and how he talked. Uh, and so that was a barrier in itself. Uh, you know, he always, he always likes to say that, that checking the box is a barrier. Yeah. Uh, and so we ended up going to a job fair and just walked in to the hiring peop, uh, manager, mm -hmm. uh, and just shared what he could do. Mm. Uh, and he was able to find a, a position. So, mm. uh, and he's been there eight years, wow. uh, doing what he does there. So, um, I think it's just, you know, you almost have to be a mama bear or papa bear, Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and try to not take no as an answer and just try to really push through, uh, through those challenges and those barriers and, and educate people about your child and their abilities. Yeah. But I think one of the things that, um, I've noticed is that, that there's, there's, um, you know, when they're born to like three years old, five years old, but then, you know, high school comes and then at some point there's some independence that the, that they also seek. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, is that where the, less the older they get the less resources there are definitely definitely you know i think some school districts are doing a good job of working on uh getting doing job readiness job coaching uh mm -hmm. for the kids and trying to figure out things that and showing those abilities that they have to do that but yeah um after like probably seventh eighth grade the resources probably cut in half oh. uh to families um and you know especially in the elementary years mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of uh folks helping you through and getting through and uh, holding your hand through the process mm -hmm. but as you go into uh late years of junior high and high school uh you know that in the, the, they're assuming that independence like you would for a neurotypical child uh and it's not always the same for uh -huh. children like my son or other kids that we serve in our organization. Yeah. So you would say that like the greater society is not, is not um, ready for, for it, it. I think it's improved. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think they're trying to figure that out and doing some different programs. I know some companies here are trying to do some uh, think tanks and do some different things to enable uh, better employment of mm -hmm. kids living with different challenges. Uh, but there, there is work to do uh -huh. uh, on that and get creative in their thinking. I think, again, it's that fear of will they be heard? Are they going to be safe? Or how mm -hmm. much is it going to cost me to make an accommodation? Uh, yeah. you know, with their schedule or with their workstation or anything like that. And, and on average, those, uh, those adaptations are pretty minimal. Mm. Yeah. And I was talking to a, um, a mother that her, her son has a uh, down syndrome and she's kind of on a mission to probably start doing something on her own. Uh, because like, you know, she's thinking, maybe thinking about opening a coffee shop or buying some land and, um, you know, creating jobs, um, which is, I'm assuming that that's kind of where you were 13, 14 years ago when you started this, right? Like if nobody's doing it, I'm going to do this. Yes, definitely. You know, before Jack had his strokes, my son, Jack, uh, you know, he was typically developing little boy playing the different activities. And when we figured out what his new norm was going to be with his cognitive delays and, and physical challenges, 
you know, there's just really not anything out there. There's some great organizations in our community, but they maybe only serve those with intellectual disabilities only or only physical disabilities. And Jack had both. Uh, and then through his rehabilitation, through physical therapy, speech, occupational therapy, he had to go through. Every day I was there, I saw new faces. Mm. And, you know, that number I shared earlier was prevalent in seeing those new faces of those children walking through the doors every day. Um, and it really impacted me um, and our family. And so we just thought these kids want to play, uh -huh. you know, they just want to play and the opportunity to play. And when Jack was going through uh, that rehab piece, you know, his therapist would share, you know, I said, well, where do kids go play? Where, where do they go mm -hmm. work on their skills? They're trying to learn therapeutically. And, and the therapists were all like, well, that's the biggest challenge. And, you know, Jack eventually plateaued out of his therapies and just got bored with them. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a kid, Yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. and so you can only, you know, kick a ball so many times or, yeah. or, you know, pick up things for working on your fingers and things like that. Um, and so when he plateaued, they gave me a 47 page home therapy plan mm. that they expected the parent me to do. And I was, you know, working and things like that. And that just wasn't feasible. And so that was another call to action to me to say, okay, we need to figure out something for these kids to be active and play and uh -huh. just show them the possibilities. And, and that's really how it started. Yeah. And I just, I, I personally, this is my uneducated opinion. So like there's uh, uh, certain communities, certain demographics groups that get kind of pushed on the fringe of society right like mm -hmm. um and uh i think that you know society turns a blind eye you know um i was watching this show on netflix that's called um uh, love in the spectrum mm -hmm. and i was watching it with my daughter and you know we're just we're just like they they also want to fall in love just like everyone else, they want to play, mm -hmm. they want to be independent, they want a job, they want everything. So um, I think maybe the the society or large thing that they're just going to live with, their, or they want to live with their families the rest of their lives, and that's not the case, right? Uh, no, I mean, Jack just moved out independently uh, into a community. Uh, and he was thrilled, you know, just as thrilled as any of our other our children, right? Uh, uh -huh. You know, they just get to that age. And I, I often share with people, you know, our kids, even though they have different challenges, you know, uh, many of them emotional age are age appropriate mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways of, you know, if they're an teenager they're a teenager uh, a little bit defiant yes. you know if they're a three-year-old they're a flight risk you uh, know because they like to run right, around right, and right, then right. young adults they they want their independence they want to experience love they want to experience mm -hmm. you know having that job and and living on their own and things like that is there something more that the the, the, the state could do the federal government could do um or is have you is that something that comes to your mind at all or you're just kind of laser focused on what you do I, I try to stay where in my lane with what i do um <laughs> you know uh but you know i think i i definitely have ideas and i know i've spoken with others on different ideas but i think i think there's some work happening to uh better uh change the waiver system for uh -huh. people that are eligible for those waivers whether it's a brain injury waiver or the different waivers that families that have children with disabilities mm -hmm. you know and and the way the supports can help them you know i can use my son as the example he's fairly high functioning compared to a lot of other kids that have a disability but he still needs support so uh -huh. you know his support would be in transportation cuz he's not able to drive and so uh but he won't necessarily need respite or uh, supported community living uh -huh. um but if you don't use those things you can't get the transportation so there's some reform you know I in see. different levels of supports that you know need to be built in and I, I think there's some small changes coming with that and uh i think also just supporting employers you know, you get waivers through your school tax dollars for the education piece. Mm -hmm. I think there should be employer incentives for this right. as well. Um, I don't know what that looks like. Um, and there's smarter people than I am on that. But <laughs> but I think there is definitely opportunity to change that. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things is that can be done is just listening, right? Listening to the families um, that are going through it and they can kind of 
tell you this would be a good addition or this would be a good um, program. Uh, kind of like what you're, you're educating uh, uh, schools. Tell us about this phase of where Can Play is. Yep. Um, yeah, in our adapted programs, we're working on, uh, you know, empowering other communities to do adapted programming. So it's our licensing model that we're shifting into. And through this model, it's using those existing play spaces in communities and their park and rec recreation programs, maybe their recreation providers that are within those organizations or those uh, uh, areas and, and providing them training and curriculum uh, on to do adapted recreation to make their communities more inclusive. And so the kids can come in and play within their own communities, not have to travel outside of their communities. Mm -hmm. And we really focus on we're, we we have the basic knowledge that hopefully a recreation leader knows how to dribble a basketball mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. shoot a basketball hoop or dribble a soccer ball. But we really focus on the adaptations uh, mm -hmm. to show them all the different abilities they might see in the program. So it's not restrictive and uh, adapt their play through our curriculum with that. So we're excited about this change and this uh, opportunity to bring it uh, further than what we're, what we're capable of doing it, uh, with our reach right now. So you're looking to talk to uh, parks and recreation, cities, mm -hmm. uh, schools, mm -hmm. for you to come and license them and give, you give them the curriculums, right? Correct. Yep. Um, YMCA's, community centers, whatever it might be, uh, to have those programs available in their communities. So uh, we're excited about that. We've done uh, test sites with Des Moines Park and Rec, uh, Waukee Park and Rec. We have Norwalk coming on, okay. uh, Altoona coming on this fall. Uh, and then we're working towards uh, Solon and Iowa City. So, uh, But we really want to get it uh, across the greater Des Moines Central Iowa community first. Mm. Um. Tell me a little bit about like the, the struggles of, of uh, getting a nonprofit 501c3 off the ground. I uh, started a 501c3 from 2012 until 2019. And um, we, uh, we were doing a, a music festival for uh, Latino music, mm -hmm. Spanish music, different genres. And I, I just remember that you just got to knock on doors and tell people and tell people and tell people and tell people. And it just seems like a daunting task uh, to get it off the ground. And you seem to have gotten over that hump a little bit. I mean, I'm sure it's an everyday battle, but can you tell us a little bit about what it, the work that it has taken you? And um, Yeah, I mean, it's really been, to me, it's about building relationships and you know, most people, when I have a meeting or get coffee with somebody, you know, they know why I'm there. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, we're going to we're going to ask yeah. that question. But, you know, we're also in competition with other many other great nonprofits in this community. And we have a lot of great nonprofits in this community. So it's just building that relationship and showing our impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Dylan and I uh, have demonstrated through, you know, keeping all of those dollars that we raise directly impacting the kids in our program mm -hmm. uh, and really try to keep a very low administrative cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he's out there doing the work in the field. I'm out playing in the field. You know, everybody in our staff has uh, program time. Yeah. Um, so they're, you know, living our mission as well. Um, but I think it's just building that relationship and showing through our numbers and the impact of, uh, of our, what, we're, what it's having on our kids and in the community. Um, you know, and we're, you know, I don't think we've, we've tried to not go back every year to the same sources and, and thank them and, and be, uh, aware of their contribution and, um, and then, you know, go back a few years later and just show our growth and different things like that. And, you know, we're excited about this licensing model because it'll then keep our overhead costs lower, but we can still almost double, triple our impact across mm -hmm. the community by Got using it. these existing spaces uh, and train those individuals how to do this. What What advice would you give somebody that has a um, that is thinking that they want to either work in the nonprofit or, uh, field or they want to start a nonprofit? What is some some uh, uh, advice you would give? I think patience. You know, I think we live in a society where it's instant gratification and, you know, uh -huh. and, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there, but it just takes work, persistence and patience and building that, um, 
building that uh, base. Uh, I think you have to, uh, you know, whoever you're serving or starting to serve in your nonprofit is making sure everybody's on board with that mission and vision um, and kind of do some testing with it. Uh, and then, um, you know, again, I just keep going back to relationship building yeah. and, and taking it slow and, and being very uh, uh, step-by-step uh, in your progression Mm -hmm. Uh, and just verifying and checking, uh, as you go, because, uh, you know, these dollars are hard to come by, Mm -hmm. um, and you want to make sure that you're, you're putting those in the right spaces Mm -hmm. and for the right reasons. And you, you partnering with, uh, your other co-founder, um, Cody is his name. Dylan. Dylan, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, partnering with him. That was a big decision for you. Um, sometimes we have a vision, right? That I want to do this. Um, and then, but then we also have to be flexible of how to get there. Um, so I, I, I heard somebody say, you have to be obsessed with the idea, but be flexible on how to get to that end, to that end goal. Um, how was that, that process for you and Dylan to like, decide to partner and and come up with the... Yeah, over, you know, uh, prior to our uh, coming together, we'd sat on different committees together and done different things. And we really, you know, agreed and and had like-mindedness in, Uh uh, you know, our involvement with different things and our mission and vision of each of our organizations. Uh, And during COVID, during the shutdown, we we truly just did a check-in and, hey, how is it going for you? Because Mm -hmm. we're very similar sized, uh, you know, one or two persons <laughs> staffed uh, programs uh-huh. uh, and uh, just trying to find, you know, how things are going for him uh, on our end, on the cur- uh, with our adapted programs. Mm-hmm. And then we just, ha- uh, the conversation just said, hey, what about, what if we did this? Mm-hmm. What does it look like? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we worked um, through some different things and we worked with the Community Foundation of Des Moines and they are great in offering support and advice uh, and going forward. Um, and it just seemed to make sense yeah uh to do this together and and combine our resources you know and and at the end of the day it was about the kids sure you know and and making sure we could make it through these unforeseen times Mm -hmm. um but continue to provide opportunities for these kids yeah when you have the same goal i think you're willing to kind of go in the trenches and maybe agree and disagree and, and, and grind it out. But you know that both or all parties have the same finish line. Right. And right. That makes it a little bit easier because like, you know, we're going to cross it. Let's just grind it out for now. Right. And you know, Dylan and I are uh, a lot different in age. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we both keep that vision of the program and uh-huh. the kids in our program is forefront at all times. I always know that when I'm talking with different projects with him, and I think he feels the same with me, that it's really about the kids. What do you think a a big mistake that somebody in a leadership role can make? I think they kind of forget about who they're serving. Mm. You know, they get away from the mission. Maybe they're not as involved. You know, I, I'm a past hospitality manager position person and uh somebody told one of my mentors in my life was always keep your hands in it uh don't forget why you're here don't step away f- too much don't step away too much you know and i know not everybody can do that mm. and i understand that mm. but i think always uh they they get too wrapped up in maybe some more of the administrative piece which we all have but yeah but i think it's just keeping your feet on the ground you know that saying where you you know keep your feet where you are and mm. And, and be involved. How do you keep it? How do you keep like um, energized? How do you keep going? Like what, what makes you wake up every day and like keep the. You know, I make an effort to most of my days of the week. I end up get to play with the kids, <laughs> Okay, now. you know, and that that has always been my. That's what makes me go. That's your fuel. That's my fuel. And also, uh, you know, the great thing about this is my family's been able to be involved with this. My husband has been mm-hmm. a thousand percent behind me in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's able to come out um, and volunteer with us. Uh, my daughter is involved. Uh, our kids have been involved in different capacities. But also my son, Jack, who the reason when this was started, uh, you know, he's 24 now, but he comes and helps coach. 
Yeah, you said that he he yeah, coaches. Yeah, he comes right? and helps coach, but he also help participates like in our young adult program. Uh, but I think it's been great to see the kids see a big guy out there and has the different challenges, walks different, talks a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, and I think it helps inspire them. But um, so my inspiration truly comes just being out there and ending my day uh, doing our work. How did you feel when you were first starting? Uh, did you when when you the idea was starting to to brew in your head uh, when you told your husband or your family? Was there anybody that was like naysayers or just kind of? You really there want to pe- do this? Yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, you know, the, just what you said, are, are you sure about this? Mm. You know, you have a great career. You've, mm. you've built this career for 20 some years and you're going to leave it. But, you know, I think from what I've gone through in my life with losing a husband uh-huh. uh, and then what happened to Jack, I think it was just a big uh, aha of I need to do something that's impactful and worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, and that was really what opened the door to this. Uh, and then just trying to be just starting small and going slow methodically. Uh, and I have, you know, um, s- a couple of our board members were there with me from the very beginning and have still been with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they've been along the journey and a great sounding boards and support for mm-hmm. us as well. And, you know, there's a lot of more people out there way smarter than me. So <laughs> I, I'm not afraid to go have conversations and get ideas and, mm-hmm. and, and just talk through different possibilities. Where is Ken play uh, in, the, in five years? Where do you see it um, in I the future? Th- I think our future is uh, full of opportunity. I think on our opportunity programs, you know, uh, unfortunately the changes in socioeconomic standing is not going to change a whole lot in the next five years. And, and just continuing to find ways to reach more kids in the mm-hmm. community that need opportunities for this. Uh, and then empowering community partners to do that as well in our opportunity programs. You know, we work with like the Des Moines Police Activities League uh, in that program and, and finding other community partners in that way to uh, reach out to the kids. And then on our adapted side, you know, I, I am hoping and praying that this or, this licensing takes off and goes beyond the borders of Iowa. You know, we want to take care of home always here in the Des Moines area, but I think what we have and what we've put together, I feel very strongly about uh, it can help empower communities to be uh, provide more inclusive opportunities. You want to go national? I do. That's, uh, and uh, somebody said, think your ideas have to sound crazy, right? Yes. Um I listened to a podcast the other day that said, you know, if you're scared, keep going. Uh huh. And, and I am worried, but yes, <laughs> you are scared. <laughs> but but I also know uh, I feel confident in what we've put together, and you know, we didn't do it in a year. Mm-hmm. We've been doing this 13 years, yeah. and so we've been very methodical and very uh, slow in developing this and making sure it's safe. For yeah. these kids and that we empower these communities and provide them effective training so they feel empowered to run this program. Yeah. And you're doing what you love. This is passion for you, right? It definitely is. Um, how do you feel about that? That, you know, um, I feel the same way. I wake up every day and I'm like, I, I don't think of us, my job as a job, you know, uh, I, I, we get to help people find jobs uh, I get to have conversations with, you know, people doing great things for humanity. So um, it's kind of a fortunate thing that we can say, right, that we can that we can get up and, and do what we love. Yes. Um, how does that make you feel? How does that feel? It feels amazing. You know, it can be daunting sometimes, but I know at the end of the day, we're doing the right thing. Mm. And that's what we always kind of go by is what's the what's the right thing to do. For this kid, for the kids, and for our community, and um, you know, I, I, I think I come home every night. You know, I'm physically tired. I'm getting older, so pl- <laughs> I can't keep up with the kids as much as I used to. But, uh-huh. but just seeing their faces and their smiles, and you know, um, our kids, my other kids in my family, maybe your kids have been part of a dance team or a soccer team or a basketball team, and that's their team mm-hmm. and their social outlet. Yeah. The kids in our program, they don't really have those opportunities. And Uh so what we provide in these settings goes, this is my team. Yes. I'm going to camp. I'm on the cam play team. Mm. And 
you know, it's fun because you see on a Saturday morning, we might do a soccer program and the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins that come out and support the kids and, and they're cheering super loud, yeah. like it'd be a championship game, Yes, you know, and that's, to me, that is so powerful to see. We might have, you know, 15 kids in the program. We limit our, our registrations, but, mm-hmm. but, uh, for safety, but we'll have probably a hundred right. family members out there just cheering and, and going crazy for these kids. So you're you're not just impacting the kids, you're impacting the entire family. Yeah, I think that's one thing I over uh, didn't I underestimated, uh-huh. you know, was uh, saying, "Hey, we're just going to play. We're going to come out here, but we've had families now, you know, we don't have the parents out on the field. Mm-hmm. We want them to watch like they would any other child." Yeah. And then they've m- built their social networks together. Uh, we have families that gone on spring break, you know, uh, we try to partner the kids by like abilities. So they get to know each other and build that friendship circle wow. and things like that. So that's amazing. That's amazing. How can people work with you? Like, uh, ultimately is creating relationships and getting the name out there and growing it. And, and, and how can, how can people connect with you and, and who, who, who uh, would be a good connection for you that that you're trying to like get over some kind of hurdle that like I would love to talk to this person? <laughs> you know, I think uh, there's great opportunities to support us through volunteerism, uh, and then in this licensing model, we're we're encouraging volunteer community volunteers to help out and be teammates in the program. You know, financial support is is a need. Uh, you know, we want to empower these, uh, communities, uh, and provide them with a licensing model that is minimal cost. So, but we have to get things produced and get training materials ready and, and train them. So the support there would help with that as well. Um, and I think it's just getting the word out to communities that this Mm -hmm. is available in their communities. Uh, there's no one person that I'm really, need to talk to i'm uh-huh. always open to talk to anybody yeah, that wants to get involved yeah but it's just getting the word out to these communities that we want to help and we want to be a part of your community through this mm-hmm. through this opportunity there's never enough awareness right right you always want to be uh, putting the name out there so if you hear this or if you see it share it with uh share it you know yeah, we share a bunch of Dumb stuff anyways <laughs> on social media. Why not share something that's meaningful? And I think also it's just families that have kids uh-huh. um, that could utilize our programs. Uh-huh. You know, that's even more important that if, you know, we get three or four more families out of this podcast that didn't have access or didn't know about it. To me, that's because a win Because there's as no well. cost to the kids. Correct. There's no cost to the kids. So um, what is your life motto? Uh, well, it's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, uh, do what you can with what you have and where you are. Do what you can with what you have and where you are. How do you, can you help me, help me? uh, I think I've just in my life, I've had some, um, tough situation, tough decisions to make. Uh, and you had to do what you could with where you are, um, you know, as far as with my late husband's health uh-huh. uh, and some with uh, such young boys after we lost him. Uh, and then what happened to Jack um, and his six strokes about 10 months after we lost my husband. He had his strokes. and You know, I've always had to just make decisions kind of quickly. Um, not as quick anymore, but during that time, it just taught me like I'm doing the best that I can. And I'm, I'm really trying to keep the health and well-being of my family and those around me in their best interest. It's about being practical. Yes. Practical with what you have and who you are at the moment. Yes. Being where your feet are and and doing what what you can to the best of your ability. Well, let's end it with that. Okay. Uh, Melissa, uh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, You do great work. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to sharing this and hopefully somebody shares it with somebody else and, and uh, uh, maybe one more family can be helped. Yes, definitely. Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, thank you. And we'll say everybody soon.